recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we're back in the Rules Committee where we've spent so much fun time together over the past month. Um, over the weekend, our Republican colleagues brought us to the brink of a devastating shutdown of the federal government. For weeks, my office has been answering calls from concerned constituents who feared that their paychecks wouldn't come and that critical government services that they rely upon would be interrupted. Thankfully, we were able to pass a continuing resolution without right-wing extremist policies in it, as House Democrats have been urging throughout this entire process, and as the Senate has apparently been able to do on a bipartisan basis. So now we have less than 45 days before another funding deadline. You know, after the majority party brought us to the brink of disaster with their reckless and chaotic approach to government funding, you would think they'd be willing to try what works, to come to the table, to work in a bipartisan manner, to honor their agreements with respect to funding, and to pass the spending bills that Americans need. But apparently not, because here we are again, considering more partisan spending bills that are loaded up with culture war poison pills and slashing uh, necessary funding. We know that the Department of Energy's funding bill, it's going to raise energy costs for working people, undermine some of our climate rescue efforts, and increase our dependence on foreign energy and fossil fuels. We know our seniors and families, if this bill were to become law, will struggle to heat their homes this winter, and that's a huge issue in my district. We're, we know that American innovation and clean energy will be stifled. So this is not serious governance. Um, Representative Kaptur, can you tell me how this bill hurts efforts to bring fuel prices down, especially our long-term efforts? Thank you very much, Congresswoman Scanlon. Uh, we have documentation we can provide to the record, but just to give you a few examples of that. Overall, many of the programs that invent the future <clears throat> or apply new technologies are cut anywhere between 15 and 40 percent, if you look at the different accounts. Uh, below <clears throat> what the President requested, as well as current spending levels. So, for example, if you look at um, the area of bioenergy, <clears throat> we estimate that uh, this bill will cut 14% from the current programs. Okay, that's about $83 million. And uh, that particular sector contributes now over a million jobs in our economy. So to the extent that you cut it 10%, 14%, 15%, wherever that is, you're, you're going to thwart job creation in those categories, and you're not going to be able to move bioenergy forward. It's really, <clears throat> I happen to represent a district that has more animals than people. And um, we have a lot of waste animal uh, doo-doo, and it is an enormous energy source. We have no rigor to move that. What, what we don't use on the fields, according to formula, we can turn into power. We don't do that simply because there isn't the incentive, there isn't the technology to move there. So that's just one. In terms of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies, this bill cuts uh, 32 a million, about 19 percent of, of that program. For solar energies, there's a $30 million cut, about 9%. In terms of wind energy, a 14% cut, which is a 71% cut below where the administration wanted. Uh, and then for water power technologies, we're at about a 13% cut, but about a third cut from what the president asked for. For geothermal, and this is one that really is so simple in a way, if people would understand what it is. Um, but that cuts about, they cut 45% below the budget request. And <clears throat> uh, that is a technology that is a healthy one for our society, if we were able to apply it uh, more quickly. Uh, in terms of building technologies, that's saving waste heat from buildings like this. Uh, we're talking about a, a quarter, 23% cut. So these are not, uh, and then weatherization Oh my goodness, there'll be 11,000 more families across this country who will not be able to have their homes weatherized. So this is a, you're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people and places, and these add up over time. So it's, as I said, this is kind of a, a new era 
uh, frontier for America, are we going to meet it or not? History will judge. But I don't think these are accounts that you short. I, you. I was also concerned by your testimony that um, this bill would hurt efforts to, that it would encourage more dependence on Russian oil. Can you talk about that? Yes. There, uh, there was an excellent article this past week in the Wall Street Journal about, um, and the Washington Post, I think, also had an article about how Russia is manipulating, because it controls its own uh, reserves, right? It can do a lot that we can't really monitor closely, but they can uh, much more cheaply draw up their reserves, put them in tankers, move them around the world, and then when they find <clears throat> the most uh, vulnerable place, they can unload that product and then it gets into international markets. And there are many Russian tankers floating around the world that have this uh, excess oil supply. So uh, the, uh, uh, I hope our sanctions will work more robustly uh, on Russia. They are making a difference, but because they are able to do so much that's hidden uh, because of their own supply lines there, uh, that is, it's a threat to our economy. If they dump it in places, then it's backdoored in here. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uh, obviously a threat to their um, economy, even though the value of the ruble has gone down by a third over this last year compared to the U.S. dollar's worth. Uh, we're making progress on our sanctions, but not enough, mm -hmm. but not enough. So our own energy independence is paramount, is paramount. And we are getting there, but we're not there yet. We can still be impacted by global oil prices. If the price of oil here goes over $4 a gallon, guess what? We always go into recession. We don't want to go there. That's why these technologies are so important. Okay, and of course we ones. don't want to encourage them to use their oil to fund their illegal invasion and, and assault upon democracy in Ukraine. That is correct. Okay. Um, we also have before us today the legislative branch bill. And as someone who spent a couple years on the Select Committee mm -hmm. to Modernize Congress, which unlike this committee is perfectly even with respect to having equal members from both party there and has produced dozens of recommendations which have been implemented on a purely bipartisan basis. Um, many of those recommendations over the past four <coughs> years have had to do with ensuring diversity among the staffing of our legislature because that's so important to get the best ideas, the best talent, and to have our legislative branch be a more um, honest and accurate reflection of our population. So I'm very concerned by what we see in this bill that would cut efforts to ensure diversity and inclusion um, in our legislative staff, staffs, and even more so because I just came from a White House celebration of the 30, uh, 50th anniversary of the Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, and the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, both of which have done so much to ensure equal participation by everyone in our society. And to see a bill that undermines that, I find extremely disturbing, and particularly with the impact as well on our seniors and veterans. Can you speak to that? Sure. Uh, thank you for that comment. And uh, just listening to uh, the chairwoman from the great state of Ohio and, and yourself from Pennsylvania, and New Mexico, and Minnesota, uh, the wonderful uh, contributions that you make to this committee. That is diversity. Mm. And if you were not here today, I, I would dare to think that if, even Mr. Amade may agree with me that it will be a bunch of middle-aged guys in dark suits uh, giving testimonies that will be kind of boring, I think, <laughs> at the very least, if not enlightening. And so <clears throat> let me share some of the... Um, inequities that exist that must be overcome. And, and the office, uh, I think, did a great job at addressing them. 87 women are promoted to manager for every 100 men. <clears throat> People with disabilities are two times more likely than those without to be unemployed. Medium weekly earnings for women are 83% of the medium we uh, weekly earnings for men. Nearly half of the LGBTQTI workers have experienced some form of unfair treatment at work. But this is a good one. This is a, an important one. 
Inclusive teams are 35% more productive. Mm -hmm. Companies are 2.6 times more likely to retain their workforce when they uh, employ a diverse and equitable uh, staff and measures are implemented in that area. So clearly, it's good for government, um, it's good for this discussion, obviously, uh, and, and it's good for the nation. Yeah, and having come from um, a private business background, certainly the corporate world is way ahead of Congress um, in, in this respect, understanding the value of diversity and doing proactive measures to ensure it because it's not only the right thing to do, it's good business. And I really, um, it really pains me to see Congress taking a step back with this bill. Um, I yield back. 